The fighters are the ones who step inside the ring and put it all on the line. Their pride, their dignity, and even their lives are at risk every time they make a ring walk. For over a hundred years, the sport of boxing has created incredible, nail-biting moments that have captivated audiences around the globe to the point that it has maintained its role as the most popular combat sport in the world. Behind every moment, every fight, every knockout, there is a promoter who makes it all possible. We have seen many promoters whose personalities transcend them from being a mouthpiece for the fighter and rather being a character which amasses a fan base within the sport. Bob Arum, Don King and Frank Warren are all Hall of Fame promoters who come to mind. But recently, there's a man whose charisma, confidence and confidence led to an incredible rise and big decline. This is the story of the disastrous downfall of fast car, Eddie Hearn. Born on the 8th of June, 1979, in the London town of Dagenham. At the time, his father, Barry Hearn, was establishing himself on the snooker scene. Just three years after Edward was born, Barry Hearn founded Matchroom Sport, which became the promotional home to such snooker players as Tony Moe, Terry Griffiths, and Dennis Taylor. This was a big step for Barry, but his biggest career move came just five years later, when he took the action that would define the Hearn family. In October 1987, Frank Bruno fought Joe Bugner at White Hart Lane in an event promoted by Matchroom Sport. Barry went on to promote fighters like Nigel Benn, Lennox Lewis, Prince Nassim Hamed, some of the best fighters Britain has ever seen. Matchroom formed a strong relationship with Sky Sports and consistently put on decent boxing events with lots of British and European title fights throughout the 2000s. However, all the big stars like Ben, Nazim, Lewis, Herbie Hyde, well, okay, maybe not Herbie Hyde. They were all gone and something new was needed. In stepped Eddie Hearn, who made sure to promote the 2010 fight between David Hay and Audley Harrison as if it was this generation's Lennox Lewis versus Frank Bruno. Audley admits he's made huge mistakes, his ego is out of control, but he's very happy, he's comfortable with himself and in his life. And you know, he's, he's in, my, in my mind, he's a favourite to win this fight. Of course, reality kicked in when the fight actually happened and David Hay knocked Harrison out in the third round. Despite how embarrassingly wrong he was about this match, he didn't stop trying and in 2012, he started putting cards on every month. Fighters like Carl Frampton, Kel Brook, Tony Bellew, Carl Frotch and John Ryder all featured on these cards. 2013 came along and things only got better for Eddie Hearn, staging his first ever pay-per-view event between Carl Frotch and Mikel Kessler in a two-belt unification match, a much anticipated rematch. Bellew and Callum Smith fought on the undercard, but the most notable fighter on the undercard was of course George Groves, who got an impressive TKO victory. Through tonight. Oh, oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Shot. And with Eddie's help, I'm sure he'll deliver me a world title, whether it's these two or someone else, but that's what I need. I think I'm ready, I know I'm ready. Frotch got his revenge against the Danish legend, Mikkel Kessler, earning a unanimous decision in a close but clear victory. This set up for what would be one of the most iconic rivalries in British boxing history, Carl Frotch and George Groves. Have a good look at these belts because this is as close as you get into a Saturday night, you're getting absolutely flattened. If you see anything in my eyes that don't make okay. sense, anything unbelievable about what I'm saying, you're getting absolutely flattened. But before their first showdown occurred, Eddie made one of the biggest signings of his career. And like I said, when we've got you know this 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 product in Anthony Joshua, this brand, we got to make sure we maximise it and we make no mistakes whatsoever. 2012 Olympic heavyweight gold medalist Anthony Joshua made his professional debut in October of 2013 and started racking up KO after KO, ending the year with already three fights and three knockouts. The build-up to the first fight between Frotch and Groves 
was an intense one, with plenty of words being exchanged. I'm just looking forward to doing the job on George Groves on Saturday night. He's had a lot to say. We've all heard what he's had to say. It's been quite embarrassing, to be honest. Um, it's been cringy listening to it and reading some of his comments. Apparently, he's going to reveal how to beat me today, so I'll look forward to that one. Uh, good luck with that one. I think he believes that I'm going to get in there and run from him, but Cole, you're wrong. I'm going to come out, I'm going to meet you. Centre of the ring, first round. And I'm going to win the jab exchanges. And I'm going to hit you with two right hands. Just two. Just to let you know, whenever I want, I can hit you with a right hand. Groves dropped them in the first round, and the fight turned into an absolute battle with the two warriors going toe to toe in fierce exchanges before one of the most controversial stoppages in boxing history. George Groves didn't even look hurt and he was still exchanging punches with Frotch. So why Howard Foster stepped in is an absolute mystery. A fight that was so good with such a bad stoppage was always gonna get a rematch. The gloves are off between Frotch and Groves in the build-up produced one of the most iconic moments in British boxing history. You too, mate. How you doing? But I can, can all pull about a little bit. Try to pull about, have a little pull and a push. There was respect between the two following their first encounter, but the disdain they had for each other was very much still there. The first fight took place in Britain's biggest indoor arena, the Manchester Arena, but that wasn't enough for this rematch. Something much bigger was needed, and so they made their ring walks in front of a sold out Wembley Stadium. The atmosphere was like no other. It was something that had never been seen before. Eddie Hearn was truly transcending the game and bridging the gap between boxing and the casual public. As you've probably already heard since he never shuts up about it, Frosh knocked out Groves in front of 80,000 people at Wembley Stadium. He played around with the idea of returning against someone like Golovkin. You know, I've, I've boxed everybody. Golovkin, he doesn't worry me. I fear no man. I'll fight Golovkin um, if I box again, but it's a big if. But ultimately, Frosh retired in 2010. This was no doubt a big loss for Eddie Hearn, but he knew that if he played his cards right, he would have a star whose popularity reached heights that Frotch could only dream of. AJ continued knocking out experienced journeymen on big cards before the time came in December 2015 where his status had reached a level where Hearn was satisfied enough to put him in the main event of a pay-per-view against Dillian White. Derek Chisora, Tony Bellew, Lou Campbell and Chris Eubank Jr all featured on the undercard to ensure the success of the event. AJ walked to the ring with Stormzy by his side and in the ring he proved that all the hype was justified. He broke Dylan White down and eventually stopped him in seven rounds. Eddie Hearn made sure to grab this opportunity with both hands and had Joshua fight three times in 2016, all against American opponents. He beat Charles Martin for the world title and then defended it against Dominic Brazil. And Eric Molina. It wasn't just the AJ show in 2016 either. Hearn delivered Tony Bellew his world title fight at Goodison Park and Kell Brook his opportunity to become a two-weight world champion. This was an example of Hearn's disregard for fighter safety. Despite the fact that Golovkin was two weight divisions above the man from Sheffield, Brooks stepped in there and gave it his all, but it wasn't enough. He suffered a tragic eye injury, which signaled the beginning of the end of his career. In 2017, Joshua faced off against long reigning heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko in Wembley Stadium, just three years after Frotch knocked out Groves in the same venue. The pair put on an iconic fight, which is considered one of the fights of the decade, with Joshua getting a dramatic 11 round stoppage victory. Hearn, once again, had reached new heights. Unfortunately for him, this was as high as the mountain went. 
Despite putting on many very good fights throughout 2017 and 2018, it seemed to be all downhill from that night in April 2017. Hearn was seemingly clutching at straws with what went on pay-per-view. Fights like Bellew vs Hay 2 or White Chisora 2 should never have been on pay-per-view, but they still did it. Good views, which is just testament to how skilled he was at selling to the paying audience. 2019 was the year when everything came crashing down. In 2018, The Zone was launched and Hearn started branching out to the US market. Bad idea. Despite putting on some good fights like Estrada Rumvasai, Hooker Ramirez and Golovkin vs Derevyuchenko on throughout that year, the American audience weren't stupid enough to buy into the lies that this was going to overtake the likes of Fox who had Wilder, Spence, Porter, the Charlos and so many other big names who actually appealed to them unlike the fighters who were headlining to the Zone US shows. It wasn't long before Eddie Hearn took Joshua out of his comfort zone and had him headline in Madison Square Garden against someone no one in America had ever heard of. Round one underway. The original opponent, Jarrell Miller, was little more well known than Andy Ruiz, but still not a big enough name for Joshua's US debut to be commercially successful. Even though Ruiz didn't have a name, you would have thought a highlight reel knockout from Joshua would have somewhat encapsulated his star power in the US, right? Well, Ruiz ended up doing the unthinkable and dropping Joshua in the third, completely destroying his equilibrium which led to a 7 round stoppage for the underdog. It was well documented that no one saw this coming and despite the fact that Joshua did regain his titles in the rematch, the second fight probably weakened his status more than it did strengthen it. Around 2 million people paid pay per view just to see Joshua play it safe the whole fight. Of course, from a boxing standpoint, he did what he needed to do to keep his titles. But boxing is a business, and to keep a hold of a casual audience, the fights need to be consistently delivering top quality entertainment and dramatic moments like Joshua versus Klitschko. You're not landing that one again. As if the Joshua fiasco that year wasn't enough, 2019 was also the year that Hearn turned boxing into a laughing stock when he allowed two YouTubers headline over two world champions. Oh yeah, and Dylan White failed the drugs test that year as well. With 2019 being an absolute disaster, Hearn wanted nothing more than a big 2020 to put Matrium back on its feet, but worldwide lockdowns made that an impossibility. Things went from bad to worse when Dylan White was knocked out in a fight against an ancient Alexander Povetkin. A new signing, Josh Warrington, got splattered around the ring against unknown Mauricio Lara. 2021 was the year Hearn made the bizarre decision to leave a powerhouse like Sky and instead have his UK fighters fight exclusively on the zone. Game changed. The new promotional company, On The Block, Boxer, have since signed a deal with Sky and have already put on premier fights like Chris Eubank Jr. versus Liam Williams, Josh Taylor versus Jack Cattrall, and of course, the long anticipated showdown between Kell Brook and Amir Khan. To his credit, Hearn held shows in a lot more countries since leaving Sky. Australia, New Zealand, Spain, Italy, and Mexico are some of the countries that he's done cards in, which is cool, but make no mistake, the UK and US are the two countries that matter the most when it comes to boxing. So the fact that Hearn is sometimes going full months without doing a single show in either of these countries, yeah, that's a big problem. Anthony, how are you? I'm coming for you. Despite his best tries to keep him away, even contemplating vacating the WBO belt at one point in time, Joshua eventually had to defend his heavyweight titles against mandatory challenger undisputed cruiserweight champion Alexander Usek. This fight was a hardcore fan's dream because everyone who knew anything about boxing knew that on paper Usek was Joshua's toughest test yet. Casual fans obviously didn't know how good the Ukrainian was so when he beat Joshua they all thought 
it was another Andy Ruiz situation where a complete unknown with no real prior accomplishments had just ran through the champ. Hearn has put on some good shows in 2022, including Conlon vs Wood, which was an absolute classic, but in terms of stuff that captivates the casual audience, once again, it was a commercial disaster. Canelo lost in his light heavyweight title pursuit against Dimitri Bivol. Dylan White got absolutely obliterated against Tyson Fury on a Queensbury show instead of a matchroom one. Anthony Joshua lost his rematch to Alexander Usek and most recently, Hearn's last hope just failed the drugs test. Conor Ben had headlined four matchroom shows and everyone thought that this was gonna be Eddie Hearn's next cash cow. Casual and hardcore fans alike were shocked when a fight between Conor Ben and Chris Eubank Jr. got announced for October the 8th. Eubank was coming down to a weight where he would be at a huge disadvantage. Everything was in Conor Ben's favor. And then the drug test was revealed. It looks like the fight everyone was clamoring for won't be happening. But that's nowhere near the biggest of Eddie Hearn's concerns. There's a good chance Ben might be banned for his failed drugs test, meaning Hearn has just lost the only real hope he had in the UK market. Despite all the memorable moments Hearn shows have given us over the years, it's undeniable that the last few years have been a disaster for Eddie. It's hard to see where he goes from here. He could possibly try to dominate markets like Japan and Australia, but when it comes to the US and UK, it is becoming more and more apparent that his grip on boxing is either coming to an end or already has.